This is Vern Benham Grimsley on campus. In assuming and making the assumption that war is the natural state of man, you have made an assumption which will ultimately perpetrate and perpetuate warfare. Because if that's our philosophy, we live out our underlying philosophies. If, for instance, a person decides that in the nature of man, if it's in the stars or it's in the genes and the chromosomes and it's in the genetic makeup of human beings that every 20 years or so, as in recent history, they're going to be going out, marching to a battlefield, and they're going to be slaying each other. If that's the assumption on which a person works and lives, it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. By the sheer fact of people believing it that intensely, it's going to happen. If it, was, if it wasn't for all the wars in the past uh, century, there would have been already too much uh, population of the Earth to hold. Let me give something that Carl Sandburg one time wrote. A little girl asked her father, what's a war, Dad? And the father said, well, a war is where two armies go out to some place on a battlefield and they start shooting guns at each other and they drop bombs on each other and sometimes they bayonet each other and then they get in hand-to-hand -hand combat and kick each other in vulnerable places and all this sort of thing. The girl listened to that for a while and said, you know, Daddy, she said, I think someday they're going to give a war and nobody's going to come. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Am I at last going to get an amen out of you? <laughs> Let's hear it. Is it possible you could agree with that? Yes, I guess so. <laughs> although, it is still, although it is still very unlikely that it will happen because somebody always feels that violence is the best recourse. It's unlikely that peace on this earth is going to happen as long as people refuse to believe that it's possible. As long as people are absolutely, utterly convinced that this world is not a brotherhood, not a family, but that people are instinctually going to war and hate each other. I don't think that's necessary because there can be a spiritual transformation in the life of an individual person. And he can begin to live as a son or daughter of God and his relationship toward the entire universe has changed. He's living differently. I would say that there is no contradiction being a child of God and living by spiritual values and on the other hand, having a very wise attitude toward social problems, toward economic and governmental problems. In other words, Jesus himself refused to make political and economic judgments of this nature. He said, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, to God what belongs to God. One time, one brother came up to him and said, my brother and I are feuding over the division of our inheritance. And Jesus said, who made me an economic arbitrator or divider of your wealth? He said, this is not my work. Sons and daughters of God live as brothers on this planet, and that's the most important choice. Each person faces. Did Jesus come up with his bright witticisms while he was driving the capitalists out of his church? Are you referring to the cleansing of the temple? Uh, well, if you would care to put it that way, yeah. In Jesus' cleansing of the temple, there's the impression among some people that Jesus was actually whipping the money changers. But it's interesting to note that in none of the versions, none of the Gospels in which that incident is mentioned, is there any mention of Jesus actually whipping a person. He was indeed cleansing out this sacrificial system, and his remark at the conclusion of the cleansing of the temple is very interesting and instructive. He said, it's written that my father's house is to be a house of prayer, and you've turned it into a den of thieves, or J.B. Phillips translates it, a thieves' kitchen. In other words, you have profaned the high spiritual purpose of man's relationship to God by making it nothing but a matter of graft, corruption, and economic wealth. And Jesus totally abominated that. What happened to the whips? What? what happened to the whips? Well, Jesus did use whips, but he used them on cattle. For example, I'm from Kansas, and if you've ever been to a stockyard, what'd you say? No. Whips are used to drive cattle, but this at no point, as I say, mentions Jesus whipping people. This would be contrary to his teachings on turning the other cheek and on loving other people. What were cattle doing in the temple? What were cattle doing in the temple? They were being sold for the purpose of sacrifice. And it's interesting that oftentimes people from the outlying regions who would come into the Jerusalem temple for some of the feasts at that time would be built unmercifully by the money changers. The money changers would sit there and they would say, for instance, you had to pay the temple tax in Jerusalem only with money that was minted by the temple. So you had to bring your Greek drachma or your Roman denarius there and you would have to change it for the temple money. And in the process, oftentimes you would find yourself shortchanged by some of the professional shortchangers who worked there. This completely made Jesus rise up in righteous indignation and wrath. This, sound, and this sounds approximately equal to what happen, is happening in churches today when you are required to give your tithe, which is 10% of all you earn, to the church so they can build bigger and be more beautiful churches so they can get more people to put in their 10%. I'm not going to pass judgment on the institutions, the religious organizations of our time. God will do that. But I am saying that as individual people, we can discover the supreme joy of human life, which is knowing, serving, and worshiping God. That is great. That's happy. It's really a delightful thing to know that you're infinitely loved. 
that you're a member in a family, that there is a new possibility for guidance in your day-to-day -day life. They talk about Jesus and love and they look back at all the history and like so many people have murdered in the name of Jesus and so many people, like for instance I was told my parents were in Italy during the war and like um, they came back and told me a story about they were like about 30 people in a church half half star half starving like the kids and their stomachs were like enlarged you know they didn't have enough food and like they were standing in front of this statue of Jesus which, which had like emeralds for its eyes it was gold plated I mean like you know to make uh, religion relevant I mean the, the I mean the church is going to have to come down to the people to blame Jesus for all the wretched things that have been done in his name would seem however. Well, no, just that, you know, I'm not blaming it. I'm just saying that, you know, I mean... I could give this analogy, for instance. Alfred Nobel invented dynamite. Or was it nitroglycerin? Uh, I believe it was dynamite. Well, in any case. Do you remember? Dynamite. Dynamite, well, for the purpose of analogy, I'll say it was dynamite. And certainly dynamite has been used to dynamite buildings and homes and all this sort of thing by fanatics. But this was not his intention in inventing it. It was to aid construction and all the rest of it. But that's a little different because uh, he didn't have control over the dynamite when it was being used in those circumstances. However, the, the church as a whole does. I mean, it should, you know, tend more to the basic needs of the people. The teachings of Jesus are totally contrary to this kind of hatred and warfare and all the rest which have been done in Jesus' name oftentimes down through history so that it would be no more fair to blame Jesus for the things some of his supposed followers have done in his name than it would be to blame Alfred Nobel for people who go around bombing public buildings and rigging automobiles to blow up when people start them and so forth. In other words, it's simply, I don't think it's fair, but I see your point very clearly and I think it's an important to you. Yeah, I, I, I think everybody Everybody knows Jesus was a great guy. I mean, he was a great, great person, but uh, the churches have taken uh, his teachings and, like, they've, uh, they've turned them around, some of them, and, like, uh, it's not actually... He never would preach uh, hatred or, or discrimination. Like I think one of the most important points on this is that maybe this generation is going as no other generation has ever... Yeah, well, like, uh, the churches have really wrecked it up, and it, that isn't what Christ is about. It's not what they've made him. Maybe this generation of young people, as no other generation in history, will have the spiritual spunk and godly gumption to forsake and forget <laughs> everything <Revolutionary attitude. laughs> and, and not be bothered so much by what's happened in the intervening centuries and actually dare to go back to what this man himself lived and taught and stood for and we can begin to live as children of one father and brothers in one family, the family of God, which I think is the ultimate ideal for what this planet can be. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's true, and and the same goes for what what God supposedly taught. They've twisted His words and changed them too, yeah. and it's just gonna you're gonna, you know, not not believe what they've been teaching the last 500 years, but go back to what the man said himself. This issue of a spiritual renaissance taking place in the hearts of individual people, of man turning to God with all his heart and serving this supreme spiritual loyalty of the universe and living as sons and daughters of God, that's a real dream and an ideal I hold. And I think that we can go out and if individual people are changed, they'll change the world. Do you think so? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, when, are you talking like about... One out of three. Well, that's not bad. <laughs> no, but like, you know, like believing like in religion, like, you know, something with Jesus where there is like a world after, right? You know, after you die. I believe there is a world after. Yeah, but like, doesn't that sort of like uh, tends to make people... Uh, to concentrate less on the problems here, like believing like they're, you know, so they're suffering here, but like, you know, in 30 years they'll be dead and they'll be living in... Oh, I can give you an illustration on this. The majority of the foreign, shall we say, refugees, orphan homes, hospitals, a lot of this kind of thing are being done by religious groups who are believers in a life they're after death, but <laughs> who in fact, who in fact are also concerned about the welfare of people. Again, to look at what's happened down centuries is not at all to look at what Jesus said to do because in his parable of the Good Samaritan he emphasized in the confrontation with this lawyer who was saying well who is my neighbor master you're saying that we ought to love God and love man Jesus two great commandments where you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart soul mind and strength love your neighbor as yourself to look at God to look at God to look at the cosmological essence as an abstract idea is really something that's um, apart from me well, cosmological essence, that very term, is a somewhat abstract idea, wouldn't you? Right. What I'm saying is that uh, we have to get away from these abstract ideas. That's a very good point you make. For example, I conceive of God as a father. Now, I don't mean this to say that God is just a big person. 
that he's a giant, such as at the top of Jack's beanstalk, but that God is personal and a person can have an experience of knowing God. What? It's very Freudian, the Jack's beanstalk. You say it's Freudian to think of God as a father? No, it's Freudian to think of God as on top of a big beanstalk. That's maybe one reason I don't think of God as that way. I think that's a concept a great many people have. God as a father, though, is to say that God is personal. A person can have a relationship with God. A person can know God. A person can have an infinite joy in feeling that he's loved by God, for example. You know, like, again, what, what you're saying doesn't really have any meaning, at least for me, because you have this concept of God in your own mind, and I'm not really aware of what your meaning, you know, is. All, the only concept that you can really communicate to me is what's, you know, what you are. The idea of God as a father is more than a concept in my mind. I would say it's an experience in my life. It's a really happy thing. Someone could accuse me of being deluded, but I still am happier every day believing that I'm infinitely loved by God than I would be if I did not believe I were infinitely loved by God. About that. I don't want to be loved by somebody I don't know. I mean, like I don't want to look... <laughs> you can know him, though. I think that's the crucial thing. Well, I'd rather know myself before I know God. Let me say something about that. I think the whole idea is to have something happen, you know, the spiritual, what kind of spiritual awakening have you had? You were referring to knowing yourself before you know God. In my judgment, a man really, truly, in a delightful sense, does come to know himself in coming to know God, that these two experiences are one experience, really, and that when a man gets to know himself, he discovers that he's not just an animal, really, but he has some spiritual spark within himself, that he has something of the divine, that of God in every man, and coming to get to know himself, he does get to know God, I believe. You've been listening to On Campus, a non-sectarian, non-denominational public affairs presentation. For free printed transcripts, write to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701, and ask for the booklet, Questions University Students Ask. It offers simple, understandable answers to some of the most perplexing questions confronting modern humankind. Who are we? Why are we here? Where did we come from? Where are we going? The title of this free booklet, containing transcripts of unrehearsed, spontaneous question and answer sessions on campus, is Questions University Students Ask. The mailing address, Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. I've also written Finding God, Getting to Know God, and Growing Spiritually about the processes of inward discovery and adventure, the new power and purpose potential for every human life. Another free piece of literature is Freedom from Fear. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international network of stations, let me spell out that mailing address once again, Box 347, Berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 94701, USA. When you write, please send us the call letters of the radio station over which you heard this international broadcast. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley reminding you to tune in again next time over this same station for On Campus. This is Vern Benham Grimsley, On Campus. You were saying that you began to become aware, almost subliminally perhaps, of a need for religion, a questing after God or reality. How would you describe that? Well, I got uh, into uh, LSD and uh, STP and grass pretty heavily and uh, stay st stayed stoned for about, I would say, about four or five months, just high uh, constantly. When I started to come down, I'd pop more or smoke more and go up again. And uh, it was a valuable experience to me personally uh, because it did drive me inward as the psychologists or police or whoever uh, say. Uh, it had the effect of making me see who and what I was. I mean this entire extended period of taking drugs? Uh, well, I guess it just brought me down to uh, a low level uh, so that uh, when I uh, went a day or two without the drugs, I saw, you know, my God, you know, good grief, what in the world? Uh, not only the drugs, but some of the thoughts I had had and uh, of uh, who am I, what am I, uh, what is the uh, the sense of uh, ambition or uh, looking to the future? Uh, I felt like a complete, you know, miserable wretch, just a complete slob. This became a very depressing thing for you then. Uh, very depressing, and I started thinking quite a bit about, uh, I guess, the time-honored phrase, meaning of life, or at least uh, some glimmer of hope on the way uh, to finding out uh, some meaning or partial meaning uh, in my life or just life generally, capital L. Or, what have you. One comedian's line to a young man, young man, someday you're going to find yourself, and when you do, you'll be very disappointed. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, horrified when I 
saw what I was and realized uh, exactly uh, who I am, just uh, uh, what I have inside of me. And uh, it was quite frightening. What about this craving of God or after religion? Uh, well, I couldn't find, all I could find uh, for answers. You're a wretch, you're this, you're that, you're a son of a gun, and so forth and so on. Uh, learn to accept it. Everybody has his own trip. And uh, I found that I just just very simply had to uh, accept the fact of God. The fact to me, the personal fact of God. That, uh, that God does exist. That there is a creator, uh, uh, something, somebody, uh, an unknown, an ex, uh, whatever uh, that just I can't explain uh, not only in words but I can't even figure out in my own own mind that I have not the slightest idea of what God is or what God does just now you were referring to God symbolically as the unknown or the X this unknown can become the known that a person can come into such a close contiguous harmony with this God that he can come to know God, he can have a sense of vital fellowship and companionship with God, that this in itself is able to transform life. If you believe, for example, that you're a child of God, that you are not somehow a cosmic orphan stranded down here on this planet Earth, but that there's a meaning to life, then this transforms the entire outlook, the entire perspective a person has, almost as if he went from down in a valley up onto a mountain top and was able to see a new panorama, a new meaning. Daring to believe that a person is loved by God, that the universe is not just benignly indifferent, but friendly, really, in the highest sense, as an act of faith, makes things different. This is one of the things that uh, has been of most comfort to me. All of my friends uh, look at girls as uh, a plaything in bed, at other friends as uh, a guy to uh, take up five minutes when we need uh, company over a sandwich or uh, borrow a car uh, and uh, much more subtle uh, things. Uh, a roommate for a semester and so forth and so on. In other words, simply using people instead of entering into meaningful relationships with them and seeing them as brothers. For example, when you go into one of these corner lunch counters around 11.30 or so and the entire counter is not completely filled up, you never sit down. It's almost as if it's an unwritten rule. You never sit down right next to somebody. You always leave at least one stool at that counter. And then finally you get alternate stools all filled up and then somebody comes in and he of course has to break the chain. He has to be the first one to sit down next to somebody and he picks the most socially acceptable person at that lunch counter to sit down next to. If one has the perspective that this planet is a family, that we're brothers because we have one father, that there's a spiritual oneness uniting us, that, in fact, we all are indwelt by something divine, that God himself has given of himself, that we're not, as I say, disconnected cosmic orphans, but rather that we can have a tremendously vital and joyous, abundant sense of what life is about as children of God and seeking a higher will than our own. Because it is because people have refused to use their rational minds and instead have uh, used their emotional parts of their mind, which they always label spiritual, that uh, the world is in such a mess. I now, think it's precisely because they have not used this spirituality. It's because we have not drawn upon this infinite they do, potential, they just call it which is love, which can manifest itself in goodness and truth and beauty, which can manifest itself in harmony on this earth and people living together as a brotherhood, children of God. That, I think, is the reason we have not had the kind of peace. Can you imagine? Let me ask you. Can you imagine if every person on this... <laughs> Can you imagine if every person on this planet thought of himself as a son of God and a brother to man? Yeah, I can, I can imagine it. We'd all be dead in about three hours. If we thought of each other as members in one family, we'd all be dead? I can't believe that. Why would you say that? It's very simple, because in order to have that thought, we would all have to be insane, and insane people don't last very long. I think it's the ultimate sanity to think that you have great value. For instance, to say you're a son of God is to say that you are a creature of value, that you're loved, that, you are, that you're cared about by God. That you are a creature, that you are inferior to something which has absolute control over you, to say that you are below something. Point number one, he does not have absolute control. He does not have absolute control. I think God has given man freedom to, to make choices to follow him or not. To say that you are a child is to say that you are inferior. And as soon as everybody believes they're inferior, they start acting that way. Inferior to what? Inferior to what? 
if God, that, that there is some other being who is superior to us and that we can never hope to become anywhere near as great as that. That is the best ah, way But to Jesus said, be you perfect father. as your Father in heaven is perfect. So he said that man can attain to God. Uh -huh. That's the whole point, that man does not remain in one, his yeah, present... What? I see. I've, I've never heard or met of anyone yet who wound up being perfect, including Jesus. But, all right. What would I'm you say was the trouble with Jesus' point. life? What would you think was the glaring imperfection of his life? Uh... Mostly the fact that, A, he blew the resurrection bit by not knowing the soldiers were going to stab him, and B, because he had a habit of losing his temper. Yes, constantly, you know, ranting and raving at uh, the scribes and Pharisees, you know, and calling them hypocrites and all sorts of terrible names. Ben, and accurate journalism. And running, running in and hitting them with whips and kicking them out of the temple. I mean, he had a very, very strong-willed uh, anger. And Let me make one was, remark. That was a sign of perfection. In the Gospels of Mark well, and John, it, where that people. incident of the cleansing of the temple occurs, in both places it says that Jesus drove the cattle out, used that as a cattle whip, but no places to say he whipped any human being. Now that's simply a matter of record, you can read it yourself, and I think it it's quite an, an erroneous an concept that he was, was still an act of anger. violent was against still people. It was still an act of anger, and it was also an act of theft. So what about righteous indignation? Is there? How do we know it was anger? Does the Bible actually say that he was angry in doing this? No, it doesn't say that at all. A person, a person. If I do it, it's anger. If I do it, it's righteous indignation. That's a good cop out. I'll have to remember that. I think it's possible that Jesus could have done this in righteous indignation because, after all, his motivation, as he described it, was that this is my father's house. This is a spiritual place. You have turned it into a thieves' kitchen, as one of the translations, the J.B. Phillips translation, puts it. And to see something which is intended to be a place of spiritual communion, the very sort you were talking about, where a man could find God, could discover God, seeing it turned into a marketplace for symbolic ritualistic slaughter and so forth, was repugnant to Jesus. Well, well there's a, theft, though. what I wanted, what I was asking was, uh, does the Bible describe an external behavior of Jesus or tell what his emotional state was? It only describes the behavior and it does not describe his emotional state. Well, isn't it possible that we attribute to a particular action the emotions we would have under those same actions, we can't, we can't condemn without anger. That isn't, you know, in other words, we don't know Jesus' motive, and I think that's right. Yeah, exactly right. We cannot look at the actions of someone without saying that they had the emotions we would have while doing the actions, which means you've just thrown the entire Christian religion down the drain. No, which means because that Jesus may not have been angry when he did that. <laughs> that. He had good motivations for it, but you just told me that there's no way of knowing what his motivations were. He may have been a political demagogue, he may have been a revolutionary, he, he may have been someone who thought he was the Messiah. But you just said, just looking at his actions, you can't tell what his emotions were. And you've just thrown the entire religion down the drain. But, oh, because you have, those good, you, have the, you have the actions of Jesus to measure, and if those actions measure up to what you want to call good, then that's enough. I don't really care okay, don't about the inner motivations, which I can't know. I can't know those motivations. Jesus said one time, a good tree cannot bear evil fruit. You don't pick apples oh, from a fig tree. You don't pluck grapes and raspberries off a ragweed. Now, I would say that therefore, if you look at a person's life, the fruit that he bears, the way he lives his life, you gain some impression, at least over a period of time, of what's motivating him. And if that person's motivated by love, he tends to manifest this in loving behavior toward fellow human beings, as Jesus did, and as we can. If you're in a, in a world that is doing so many injustices to minority groups to you know to wherever it is and you just sit there loving people where where do you what are you doing i had you're a black friend to say to me the other day that there is no such thing as an innocent bystander because if you're standing by and you see your brother being hurt there's no such thing as somehow being aloof and above this and being innocent he's still your brother and this is of course the very point that jesus made so beautifully in his parable of the good samaritan about a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, who was beaten up, and then it was the religious people, and this is a telling point in Jesus' parable. It was the priest and the Levite who went by on the other side and who did not help this man, and finally it was a Samaritan who happened to be a member of a group eschewed and hated by the Jews who ministered to this man, and Jesus said, go and do likewise. It's not just a matter of sitting by and thinking good thoughts toward other people, but it is a matter, finally, of getting down and helping another person because he's a brother. The idea of being loved by God is transformative, and it, too, is an experience which is spiritual, which is known inwardly, not just intellectually, not merely cognitively, but it's experienced that man can have this feeling of being in a friendly universe. You've been listening to On Campus a non-sectarian, non-denominational public affairs presentation. For free printed transcripts, write to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701.
and ask for the booklet, Questions University Students Ask. It deals with such issues as science versus religion. How might a person define God? And to what extent is religion relevant in a scientific technological age? The title of that free booklet, once again, Questions University Students Ask. The mailing address, Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. I've also written Finding God, Getting to Know God, and Growing Spiritually. About the processes of inward discovery, the new power and purposeful resource inherent in living by faith. And another free piece of literature is Freedom from Fear. The mailing address box 347, Berkeley, California. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international network of stations, let me spell out that mailing address once again. Box 347, Berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 94701, USA. When you write, please send us the call letters of the radio station over which you heard this international broadcast. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley, reminding you to tune in again next time over this same station for On Campus. And may God's will be done by you. Good day.